The summer of 1967 saw Tasmania experiencing extremely dry conditions. On February 7th, with a combination of 110 kilometre winds and temperatures reaching 39.4 degrees, dozens of fires broke out across southern Tasmania. Over a thousand homes were lost in the fire. Businesses and public infrastructure were destroyed and over 200 square kilometres of land was burnt out. The bushfires almost completely destroyed the towns of Snug, Ferntree and Middleton, while the city of Hobart was blanketed in thick smoke. 62 people lost their lives and tens of thousands of livestock perished. Shortly afterwards, two survivors, Eve and Grace, recorded their experience in letters. Tuesday started off by being terribly hot right from the start. At midday it had to be felt to know what it was like. The temperature was 102 degrees and the wind was almost a young gale and searing hot. It was dreadful. At one o'clock the smoke was so thick that the heat seemed less. It was just about three o'clock when everything seemed to start. How the fire brigade managed to get brigades everywhere at once, no one will ever know. But sirens were blowing continuously, or so it seemed. The smoke was so dense that from our back veranda it was absolutely impossible to see even as far as Macquarie Street. About three o'clock, the sound of crackling made us look towards Macquarie Street and through the smoke we just made out a thin line of fire which turned out to be the historic old mill in Gore Street and also a furniture factory in front of it. Later on that historic old brick house adjoining the mill went too. I couldn't see anyone attempting to save it through the smoke. It would be hopeless in any case. So they all went with just their shells left standing. The sound of crackling seemed more directly below us and glimpses of flame show that it was below and behind Vaucluse Hospital. We hosed all along the bottom fence and over into the peoples below. It was a dreadful feeling. How long we prayed that the Lord would send heavy rain. The smoke was thicker than ever and cars had to light up. We then ran the hoses up and hosed the hedges in front of the house. The man opposite hosed his front fence and house. This was because by then sheets of flames could be seen up the street on the other side, up above William Street, and people said two houses were gone. Soon it changed to six houses were gone and the fire was coming down. It really was a terrifying afternoon. Actually, a row of nine houses went, then some gaps, and in all, 16. We have not been up to see it, it's all too awful. But sightseers are there all right. It's been like a very busy thoroughfare with cars up and down. The whole air was just explosive. The fire leapt from Forest Road in the gale wind and we heard that five houses went up in Liverpool Crescent. It leapt towards South Hobart and the South Hobart Baptist Church went. Miss Dobson's house caught a light. Violet and the nurse got Miss Dobson out of bed and somehow into a car. Neighbours dragged furniture out. Papers were flying everywhere. We just happened to see one flash of flame over in Davies Street as the smoke cleared for an instance and have since heard that it was a tree caught alight in old Mrs Garrett's garden. It shows how explosive the air was, just a blazing cinder and something else went. Waterworks Road, so a man told me this morning, would make you weep to see it. All the houses on the road just completely wiped off. Jean, a few houses below us, wrapped the children in wet blankets and went out into the road 
and saw her place saved. The remarkable thing about everywhere is that weatherboard houses here and there remained isolated amongst complete ruins of other and better houses. There seemed to be no explanation of how, here and there, one went but others on each side were safe. We heard just now that Ian had to run a mile through it all. I also heard of a lady who had to run through two blazing hedges on either side of her up Robbie's Gully. She got through safely, but others up at Cascades perished. Poor things. The place looked so depressing, all around charred ruins and not a blade of grass anywhere. But one thing we can be thankful for is our lives, and believe me, we are lucky to be alive, as well as having our house. It is unbelievable. If you could just see how close the fire came, and the outhouse so burnt, you just can't believe the house still stands, with roses blooming in the garden, and flowers still out in the little green part around the house area. I fled with very little on, fortunately grabbing a brunch coat on the bed. I took off a nylon frock as I thought I would go up in flames as I ran, to let the dogs out from the kennels down by the gate. The firefighters demanded all women out, so I just didn't have time to get dressed, but went as I was with a French poodle in one arm and a brunch coat in the other, crying about leaving all my beautiful cats and dogs in the house, as I thought, burning to death. I unlocked all the dogs and called for them to follow me. Only one went back and stayed in his kennel, but the firefighters saved him. So altogether, I never lost one animal belonging to other people. The only thing we lost was our goat. Johnny managed to set him free. How, I don't know. The flames were almost to her when I ran down, but she ran into the fire and died so quickly. She never suffered at all, as John said. John came after me with Mavis, who lived in the flat above the house. They managed to save a few things by bringing them down to the house, but of course we never expected the house to be still standing so we were both expected to escape with just what we stood in. I really can't explain what it was like. In fact, it is something impossible to relate. When I get over, I hope to be able to tell you in person. Up to the present, we are in a dither. No light for a week. We had to put in our own pole, then the hydro came and had it connected for us. It was real primitive for a while, but we were happy to put up with that when you think of other people not even having their homes. We were grateful for even small mercies. Molly, there's no doubt we all have lots to be thankful for, and without a doubt I have never been so close to death and experienced such an experience. I'm feeling much better in myself the last couple of days. Had a hairdo yesterday, and that's a good booster at any time. Received a letter from Don telling me Marg is OK, so glad all is well there. Received a letter from Sandy with a cheque for £20. Wasn't that wonderful of her? We are, we are wondering how we will stand as we lost so much which was not insured. However, all in good time we will find out, I expect. <laughs>